morning, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. And as Nish said, this is the, the last uh, workshop of this series, not the last workshop at all. Last workshop of series of eight um, initiative workshops that we focused on on climate, energy, transition, finance, and green hydrogen playing a very central role in those those discussions. As, and as Nish mentioned, we, we started off... Uh, uh, with our uh, first workshop back in September, focusing on the risks in uh, in uh, energy transition, what were the challenges, and we've identified more than 45 individual risk classes. And to mitigate each one of them individually, we've developed a library of uh, financial structures and instruments. And, and then really uh, the workshops were to bring the narration out on how those library uh, uh, how the library can be implemented in either a particular geography or a particular sector or addressing uh, a specific issue on, on financing. Uh, the last one was on, uh, on equity, how we raise, uh, bring more equity to the markets, as uh, has been said by all of our uh, lead discussants and uh, members in the workshops that we need, or India alone needs, about four to five hundred billion dollars between now and 2030 to uh, to address its uh, energy transition and decarbonization uh, goals and objectives. Uh, and if we if we break that down into a 30 percent, one third equity, two thirds debt, uh, we would need the best part of 350 billion dollars of debt. So where's that going to come from? Uh, what are the challenges? What are the impediments? What are some ideas um, and, and what should get implemented in the coming future uh, is the topic of today's workshop. And I'll, uh, I'll ask a fairly sort of open-ended uh, question if each one of you in the same sequence could uh, maybe just two or three minutes each on um, some of the uh, challenges that you are seeing in the, uh, in the provision of debt for, for projects, uh, you can we can talk about your specific challenges. You don't have to talk about everything else in the market because that's what we're going to cover during the rest of the, the, the panel. So starting with Amit, uh, what what specific uh, challenges that you think uh, that Avada would face or generally your peers would face or are facing in uh, in the financing and and of course you can you can also talk about some of the successful deals that you've been able to close um so not just necessarily the challenges but also some positives uh, as well so let's look at both sides of the coin uh, i think the challenges uh, if really i have to sum up the challenges that the industry or say developers like us are facing is primarily in terms of raising finances for uh, because the overall target for renewable energy projects in India is so large. It cannot only be driven by the central utilities or the big five, the chosen five, so as to say, the NHPC, NTPC, uh, SJV and uh, SEKIs of the world. And therefore, the state utilities also have a large role to play. Uh, whereas the obviously the, the the pipeline of bidding from the central utilities is much much higher much bigger but state utilities are also coming up with their own uh, bidding pipeline uh, unfortunately or incidentally i would say the interest from a lending community for uh, uh, projects for financing the projects uh, for state utilities it's 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 a little lacking and uh, therefore uh, we uh, so that's I think one one key area uh, which which we are uh, you know facing a little bit of an issue. Another emerging challenge that I could see is that given that they, we are moving to a RTC or say a hybrid kind of a structure, uh, whereas the overall uh, volumes are not very high in that space right now, but that uh, space is going to um, you know really become very large and given that most of their the uh, the offtake risk lies with a corporate entity the uh, you know for uh, for the lenders to sort of really assess the the you know robustness of the ppa 
and then price those projects uh, accordingly i i i could see a initial challenge there again preferences for um, a high rated corporate entities entering into cni is obviously better but um, the real bulk of that transition uh, story on the cni aspect would come from uh, mid level players middle rated players and therefore um, i think uh, you know we we see we see a challenge there so i think these are the two points which really you know i can i can think uh, up front or you know off the cuff uh, in terms of sort of an achievement i think uh, we have um, coming back to the bidding pipeline i think we have uh, uh, there is a huge amount of work which the government of india is doing on bringing the uh, you know the the chosen five to come up with a very extensive bidding pipeline in fact avada and it's a public information we just won a 1 gigawatt uh, ac project uh, last week which is actually going to be the single largest uh, ipp uh, utility project in the country till date so so whereas the bidding action is really picking up and it helps uh, that pipeline coming from central utilities because uh, the lender appetite is definitely there uh, which ensures uh, at least one key factor which is the availability of debt uh, being met because there's a lot of lender appetite uh, other than that in terms of uh, i think another positive that we have seen is that uh, we have just recently uh, you know closed a cni transaction uh, with a a fairly large a mix set of 8 9 uh, corporates uh, which was uh, it took us some time but we sort of got a private sector lender to underwrite that entire project it was close to uh, a little less than 400 crores of debt and uh, um, so yes uh, i think with a period of time you know lenders are sort of warming up to the uh, to the cni uh projects which is not a single party cni or a very top rated cni it was a mix of about 8 9 uh, smaller players putting together a 70 80 megawatt capacity so we have been able to close that and we have drawn also so i think the lender appetite was uh, decent uh, for that transaction so so yeah i think uh, we are making progress but i think the the amount of or the, the the target that we have in front of us is so large is that um, especially we developers are a little always a little uh, you know impatient so we would like more action and you know uh, more uh, uh, sort of transactions taking place at a much uh, uh, higher pace than uh, what is happening currently uh, but yeah i think i'm i'm very hopeful of the of the direction that the uh, lending market has taken uh, when i meant transactional speed i think it's about uh, for the areas where we would like them to be fast for example if it's a seki or a nhpc or a or a juvnl i think lenders including sara would be much faster uh, but uh, the projects which really need their help in terms of a little lower um, in the credit scale i think that's where we would like to see a little more action i mean thank you so you you kind of two major uh, issues one is the the off take discom risk outside the big five and then uh, how do you how do you kind of harmonize uh, or understand or price the cni risk the off take risk given uh, there's a lot of rtc and hybrid um, <coughs> power coming into the into the mix as well and then uh, perhaps from a transactional speed standpoint uh banks are probably taking longer to to assess the risk and do their due diligence is a um, another issue that you uh, you you identified so let's let's start with that and uh, maybe good time to bring sort of uh, so you know i would uh, begin by putting in some you know some numbers in context uh, for the overall uh, energy transition space to begin with so we have uh, you know uh, the target of 500 gigawatt for renewable generation capacities uh, by fy30 which would uh, entail a you know annual uh, capex uh, debt funded capex part of uh, you know or the debt requirement of 2.36 lakh cro- uh, lakh crores uh, we have around 51000 uh, you know uh, circuit kilometer for transmission capacities to uh, to complement these uh, you know renewable capacities 
which would add another 26000 crores uh, of annual debt requirement and then uh, we are talking of green hydrogen of you know 5 mm tpa by 2030 so obviously it might come in it, it might not come in by 2030 or it might come in a bit of uh, you know chunky debt deployment but again we amortize it over 6 years we get 1 lakh uh, crores uh, of uh, you know debt requirement for funding this uh, 5 mm tpa of green hydrogen by fi 30 so we are talking of 3 lakh 62000 crores as uh, you know and i am not including here uh, battery storage uh, uh, evs and you know ev related uh, infrastructure funding uh, requirement uh, you know which which obviously would not be as large but uh, i am not including it i am just including the three key chunkier and more capex intensive uh, uh, segments of the energy transition space and we arrive at a figure of 3 lakh 63 lakh 62000 crores of debt requirement on an annual basis which is a staggering number if these targets are to be met and these are not paper targets so to reach these numbers uh, you know so again i'll begin with as amit began i will begin with the negatives so you know the capital has to be churned from the banks to say a mutual fund or an insurance or a pension uh, you know fund uh, for the banks to take up greenfield project finance uh, a part and for the operation assets to be you know offloaded from their books and graduate to the debt capital market unfortunately you know all the green bonds in the energy transition space do not uh, you know exceed 5000 crores in the past say 3 to 4 odd years uh, uh, when these bonds have started coming in including uh, the avada bond uh, which axis bank had you know partly underwritten and other bonds we had uh, you know uh, so so there have been other bonds as well uh, uh, from vector green uh, and and other players as well so when you are talking of 5000 crores as the you know dcm appetite in but in the past 4 years and we are talking of 3 lakh 62000 crores as the annual uh, debt requirement in the energy transition space there has to be a paradigm shift uh, within dcm uh, for you know uh, freeing up uh, uh, obviously uh, you know the debt numbers Uh, i would not have the debt numbers readily available for the you know uh, for the green transition uh, space which has already been deployed but it would run in you know we uh, it would run into lakhs of crores so for for that debt to be placed in the dcm market for the banks uh, and idfs which have primarily been the lenders banks idfs some nbfcs have been the key lenders in the overall energy transition space so far for their balance sheets to get freed up to take new uh, greenfield projects uh, this transition has to be uh, has to be done and even in the green bonds which we have seen so far the banks and idfs are predominantly the uh, uh, they have deployed the funds in these bonds there has been no offtake uh, from be uh, you know be it a pension fund or an insurance uh, company uh, you know and i do understand mutual funds would have their own limitation given the fact that they have to have on tap uh, you know liquid assets in their books so uh, but Uh, you know the way i uh, i foresee uh, a solution to this is that we need a regulatory push wherein you know 1 to 2% of uh, the mutual fund aum and uh, say you know 1 to 2% of uh, aum for a pension fund or an or an insurance company uh, should be uh, there sh- there has to be a regulatory push wherein that kind of a number has to be deployed uh, in the green bond space primarily or predominantly in the energy transition space and even that number would not bring in more than 30 40 000 odd crores because we have 15 lakh uh, crores as aum for mutual funds and uh, yeah, you know pension fund and uh, uh, insurance companies taken together would not exceed 30 to 40 000 crores but this could be a step in the right direction to deepen the dcm markets uh, to begin with and in case you know uh, uh, the track record is good after 2 to 3 years you could increase this percentage to 5% uh, that alone will uh, you know uh, uh, will aid the india uh, you know uh, transitioning on the energy side to a cleaner energy and uh, as i said uh, we are not talking about the battery ev and storage uh, capacities and uh, you know manufacturing capacities which will uh, further add up to this number so uh, this is the problem or this is the concern area which i foresee and this is a solution or on the positive side this is how uh, i expect the transition to be uh, so while uh you know there are certain banks including axis bank and other banks who are keen uh on uh you know taking uh, taking up credit subsidy book exposure on the renewable or on the energy transition space 
uh, but banks uh, nbfcs uh, few nbfc select nbfcs and select idfs can only do uh, do their bit this needs to be complemented by a regulatory push so so thanks uh, just for the benefit of uh, the participants could you just briefly highlight what is the regulatory constraint uh, for insurance funds pension funds and mutual funds to not be able to participate in the uh, in buying into the bonds so mutual fund i mentioned it is illiquid so there is no constraint on uh, uh, insurance and uh, pension funds to invest in but there are uh, you know two issues one is uh, that of uh, in the past uh, because of the variability in the wind sector they have been put off uh, from investing in uh, in the renewable space and uh, you know till some time back wind was leading solar in india so that is one uh, aspect which now anyway solar is leading uh, wind and is more uh, I, there is no you know positive negative but yes solar is uh, the variability is relatively lower than wind uh, having said that uh, so so one aspect is uh, the variability in the wind uh, you know plfs which has been there and second is the rating so you know double a and above is the rating uh, criteria for uh, you know insurance and uh, pension funds to invest in a in a in a uh, rupee bond so to say and most of the infrastructure uh, uh, projects uh, green you know in the energy transition space would struggle on a a rating or a, a handle rating also so while crisil did come up with the uh, you know an el uh, 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 scale uh, rating el method uh, expected loss uh, rating but that has not picked up so you know so two push uh, two types so so el1 and 2 is something which an insurance and a uh, pension fund is uh, you know okay to invest and there are regulations in place for that as well however the push for this you know el rating as a methodology uh, or as a construct to pick up and secondly since uh, you know uh, uh, there has been a challenge on the uh, plf variation and otherwise even taking a call on an infrastructure project with a 20 year 25 year tpa and you know that kind of a return period is difficult there has to be a regulatory regulatory push on this you know percentage of aum to be deployed for green bonds uh, that's uh, you know so there is no constraint as such but it is more like just like uh, you know uh, 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 you know insurance is a push product so uh, it becomes a uh, uh, you know regulatory push would help uh, the green bond in a in a big way yeah great thank you thank you very interesting and perhaps either uh, you know calls for a credit enhancement structure if there is a uh, uh, an underlying uh, rating issue per se uh, there are already questions starting to come in uh, from the audience but we'll take those uh, when we when we open it up so thank you sir for your opening remarks uh, chandra can i uh, bring you in uh, do you concur or what are your sort of from your client bases uh, that you managing what's what's uh, what are their experiences in terms of raising debt in the market so uh, you know if you look at the entire uh, process of energy transition uh, and a requirement for energy transition the funding requirements are going to be huge you know as uh, saurabh mentioned that it's going to be anything between 3 to 4 lakh crores annually for the next 7 to 8 years uh, we are looking at 500 gigawatt of renewables probably the number would only increase in the coming e- coming years because uh, you know if you look at the the requirement of power in india uh, uh, the current per capita consumption is hardly 1200 units us is probably at 10000 or 11000 units per per capita so looking at all that the requirement for you know energy requirement for energy storage because you know we have our own research and our own estimates say that uh, the requirement for energy storage could be anything between uh, uh, you know 300 to 400 gigawatt hour looking at what could happen on the renewable side the funding requirements are used currently energy storage as a stand alone is facing challenges in terms of uh, 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 you know getting funded because uh, it more needs to be funded on a capacity basis rather than being funded on a uh, 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 you know per unit basis uh, otherwise it becomes a very competitive and becomes very difficult to get funded green h2 is also another area where uh, government has kept a large target in terms of funding but uh, how will that actually come through because ultimately it should not become that you know everything becomes a balance sheet based business rather than becoming a cash flow based uh, you know financing so important parameters are that uh, uh, you know we need to look at pension funds uh, uh, you know insurance companies who are coming out with long term 15 to 20 years sort of a funding scenario uh, 
maybe what could possibly come out as a as a you know solution to this could be a probably a revenue based or a escrow based mechanism which can actually help uh, let me elaborate here with a transaction that i've done in the past in punjab where we actually funded punjab state electricity board where <coughs> the entire cash flow of the state was actually tapped into a particular account and we had the niche uh, you know first uh, we were the first few who had the charge on uh, you know all these cash flows even before the uh, state salaries were paid so some kind of innovative structuring actually needs to go into it and uh, if you look at some of the uh, funding that scenarios that could actually have, that have actually come up for bus financing in india because most of the bus financing is actually moving towards uh, uh, you know revenue per kilometer basis uh, what could possibly happen is that uh, you know once a spv is created uh, the spv should actually ideally give an escrow mechanism which can actually help the uh, financer to you know fund the entire uh, look at uh, security of the cash flows if there are any shortfalls the state could look at three months of some sort of revolving credit uh, which can be passed through budgetary allocation into the into the spv as and when required so these are some of the important areas we need to be funded maybe uh, you know as the saurabh said that rating is an issue for most of the uh, you know mutual funds to invest into and liquidity is also an issue maybe invit could be an important area to look into from uh, you know because some of the power assets are there in the invit scenario and they could possibly be a, a good solution from a exit point of view also so you know uh, long term financing obviously is, is, the, is the right solution but ultimately you know how do you look at uh, uh, you know credit rating how do you look at uh, important parameters like uh, you know carbon credits and green credits coming through and uh, you know in between rbi had come out with a policy on take out financing also so how do we can actually you know go go in for a for a 2025 year sort of a funding with 7 to 8 year take out financing being already arranged on day one i think this could be some of the ideas which one can actually look at from a funding point of view as far as uh, you know short term funding is concerned nbfcs can come forward but obviously the cost of funding for nbfcs is on the higher side and then they could have some limits from a banks and financial institution which can be backed by some bank guarantees or something uh, which can actually you know help us smooth the entire uh, uh, flow in terms of the credit but ultimately more important parameter is that how do you uh, ensure that uh, you know that the real challenge of long term funding coming into play uh, is going to be the real uh, you know emerging scenario for india and uh, uh, you know we need to push uh, for more uh, possibly international line of credit which can actually be some sort of a sovereign support can be given by the government to uh, for the hedging cost and it can possibly help in terms of how we can look at uh, you know getting into a low cost financing scenario with some support from the sovereign uh, um, uh, you know government of india uh, most important part uh, to understand is that government has come out with so many pli schemes uh, and so much of incentive maybe something like 1 lakh crores or 1.25 lakh crores worth of incentives have already been given but the most important parameter is that if you look at compare what has happened in the us and the number of incentive the, the us government has actually given incentives which are probably in the range of 400 billion dollars then the percentage of incentives in the initial scenario should actually increase so that bankers become more you know or the financiers actually become much more comfortable and we can evolve at a scenario where in the next 3 to 4 years after the project actually is completed one can look at some sort of a uh, uh, you know steady cash flow or some sort of a support which can actually help in terms of uh, ensuring that the project gets more than out so these are some of the initial concerns and some of the possible solutions which one can look at chandra thank you for touching on number of those uh, points and i think we'll we'll uh, come back to uh, explore the punjab escrow mechanism that you created you know slightly further down in the in the dialogue but thank you for touching on number of points you mentioned uh, uh lines of credit uh, international sovereign fx swap me- mechanisms and tapping into global bond markets uh, whether through invit or or any other yield co structures and, and that's a nice segue to to joyvin who's an expert on uh, on this area joyvin you've heard uh, from the other three uh on some of the limitations in the uh in the domestic money markets and uh, we've always propagated that for all emerging economies if they have to accelerate on the green transition journey on that road you have to tap into global money markets where there's 100 trillion dollar sitting uh <clears throat> under under management so what are what are uh, some of your reactions to what's been said and uh your experiences joyman from from where you sitting looking into india <laughs> in asandeshagran saurabh you know it's very interesting to hear your perspectives the 
you know, first Green Bond was issued in 2007 with the support, I think, by the European Investment Bank. And you know, fast forward to 2023, we are with more than 2.5 trillion dollars green bond issuances. And we got to look at the reasons why it's become a, such a popular instrument uh, globally, especially with fixed income investors. Um, one of the main drivers behind this is because over the years, the understanding of what a green instrument or an ESG thematic bond means has increased. So, so, so the understanding of what a thematic fixed income instrument has increased exponentially, especially with the fixed income investors, uh, you know, globally. Now, taking that into India, you know, if you look at the Indian green bond issuances, the bulk of it is actually the sovereign bond issuances which have come in place, you know, as of February 2023, there was a large issuance, I think, by the Indian government. But if you look at the others who actually need to issue green bonds, either they are small or small size entities, others may have issues with you know, the, the credit risk perception, uh, with them not being able to tap the capital markets. Um, there's an issue with you know the typical investors such as mutual funds, insurance companies not being able to allocate uh, some of their investments into these portfolios because of the features of inherent features of these issuers or the fact that they don't necessarily are they're not necessarily compelled from a regulatory perspective to allocate some of their assets under management towards uh, you know thematic fixed income instruments. So it's it's a, it's a it's a confluence of factors which kind of uh, militates against the popularity of green bonds, especially issuances from India. You all also have to look at things like um, is the market conducive to FPI investors? You know, uh, in, FPI investors and foreign portfolio investors coming into India and and investing in green bonds. I now green bonds. We have to create a regulatory system where we. A, there is a push by the regulators to enhance and increase the supply of green bonds, incentivize the end investors to allocate some of their portfolio into green, and thirdly, make the instrument so bankable, bankable from the sense that to the extent that it's a it's a it's a power generation company or a or an or, or a type of entity which otherwise <clears throat> would be perceived to be uh, higher perceived to be having higher credit risk, you have either the regulator or other institutions standing in as providing sort of blended finance solutions, which might help with these entities coming onto the market. So I think it's a it's a it's a, it's a few things which we have to consider to enable um, green bond being a, a a regular thing in the market as we've seen offshore in the fixed income uh, space uh, globally. What was the quantum you said uh, of green bond issuances since two thousand seven? Three the, trillion. I mean, close to three trillion now. Right, and, and that's a great trajectory, uh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and and uh, um, uh, Sora mentioned that we only have about five thousand crores, which is what six hundred odd million uh, issued in India. Uh, so huge, huge differential, right? So something, <laughs> something, something's Absolutely. amiss. So, so if you were to put your finger on the pulse, yes, it's trip. It's a confluence of a potpourri of uh, of various factors, but uh, ultimately the supply of money. Uh, risk adjusted, risk weighted uh, supply of money is uh, is very much uh, 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 function of the, where the greatest liquidity pool is, right? And the greatest liquidity pool is in the insurance funds, the pension funds, uh, the mutual funds, right? So, so, uh, and the reason that they are not investing is not so much as uh, they don't want to invest. The returns are are amazing. Um, we know that, the risk is high. right? The risk is yeah. Is the risk high? Right. That's the question, right? Um, so if 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 invits are 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 currently getting off the block, uh, listed funds and and the London markets uh, are hundred year old plus structures, very well trodden pathway for all the institutional money investors to come into this asset class. 
uh, either through a equity model or or buying into a green mod uh, framework um, something has to happen to connect the pipes between the institutional money and and the and the underlying assets right so is the risk high is my question right so uh, so my answer to that is uh, it's not necessarily about the risk also um, so you have to so for instance you know i i have a sit with my bank in dubai uh, which invests in global fixed income portfolios with various asset managers now one of the buckets of investments is actually a sustainable uh, fixed income uh, you know bucket of uh, products <clears throat> i chose it because i wanted to ensure that my investments are going towards sustainable exposures because i my you know my consciousness is also about the fact that as an investor this money goes there's an impact to as well as a return now i think in india if i am a typical mutual fund or an or, or a pension fund investor retail investor i also need to understand have that you know have that esd consciousness where the importance of investing in in climate friendly sustainable products is is seen as an end in itself together with the returns that you would get so it's also about um you know my my view is also about creating a uh a, a situation where you you make it so uh mainstream fixed fixed income you know the thematic issue as such as green bonds such that the population understand what this means population and un- understands that this is investors understand I mean, you know the retail investors understand the benefit of going for this they see the risk adjust returns being commensurate to their expectations and you know whether there is demand supply will follow you know if if pension funds and insurance companies see see the benefit of having a larger esg themed or sustainable themed uh, product in it by in, in itself success they get success and i think there'll be more liquidity uh, in, in the market by having by us seeing more more issuers come see the benefit of going and taking this route the other problem is also that you know if i'm an issuer the issuing domestically in india if i have to issue a green bond there are you know from a compliance perspective it's slightly more expensive or the perception is that there's more expense and compliance to be adhered to uh, as an issuer in india so if there is a, a real benefit to me as a issuer in india where if i go and issue a green bond even uh, domestically i might have a greater demand i'll get better exposure i'll get better engagement by, by the private sector as far as my esg ambitions are concerned those are some of the soft driving factors which might encourage you know more issuers to come to the market and more investors to take exposure to it great thanks doivin and and let me just stretch that question that point out a little bit further and bring a dimension if you hear all the the sort of uh, business media channels and uh, hear market experts and commentators talking about india's equity markets uh, you know everyone saying oh i made 20% return and i made 18% return and i made 25% return on my on my portfolio so so maybe a question to saurav and uh, uh first and then amit um the reluctance of institutional money to invest in in green bonds is it because of the success of indian markets equity markets and they're saying why bother with a standard 8% return when we can get 12 15 20 right. so on the institutional appetite or the institutional thought process uh in you know infrastructure investment or in a green investment green bond or a green investment with uh, uh, the equity market so see we are talking about uh, primarily insurance and pension funds or you know which cannot you know go long on equity alone so they have to have a diversified pool of investment that's my limited understanding and within that bucket uh, you know we are saying that if we can have a push a regulatory push to have you know some percentage very small one person to begin with uh, because as i said uh, there has been some reluctance primarily on two counts one is the you know uh, the return period is 20 years 
broadly say and it is not a liquid uh, instrument there have been challenges on the wind uh, variability uh, when wind was uh, predominantly or was the larger part of the renewable pool and also the fact that uh, you know while with lps uh, coming in payment uh, of the dues and the payment efficiency of the discoms have improved but the overhang of state discoms financial health impacting the project's cash flows is there on every uh, investor every lender's mind still and which amit rightly pointed out in the beginning so given all these constraints uh, uh, so as i said i'll just summarize insurance and pension funds or companies have their own buckets of debt investment of equity investment so i don't see uh, indian uh, equity uh, story spoiling the chances of investment in infra especially on the debt side that we are talking about not on the equity side however uh, the push is required because there have been uh, historical uh, uh, context because of which the investment has not come in there is the discoms health and uh, you know uh, insurance and pension companies with a uh, sort of you know annual irr and long term investment thought process they are best suited to uh, to to spur the uh, dcm growth story in green space but since it would not be a pull uh, it's not a pull uh, uh, factor which will work it's a push factor and i think we are all agreed on uh, on this fact and the very fact that it has worked uh, in a european or an american setting and not in india uh, as uh, you know uh, joyven rightly uh, summarize the numbers also which are there is a staggering difference there is because of uh, primarily the discom health and the fact that steady cash flows will be there in on a timely basis or not because of which this investment is not coming in great so i think that's that's kind of summed it up all that it's not the so much as the lack of interest but it's uh, it's lack of enough supply of high grade uh, uh, paper right when you say the minimum investment grade is double a and you don't get enough supply of that that kind of paper which prevents the institutional money to to allocate i mean typically most most of them would would do their proper allocation across equities and and uh, and fixed income asset class right so uh, uh, so it's lack of enough high grade paper coming through which and if you peel the onion layer even further that's because uh, uh there is an off take risk or an overhang from a sector risk such as wind that that you alluded to um <clears throat> amit is that is that a fair fair assessment yeah i think uh, uh, what saurav is saying is it's quite i was in fact just uh, jotting down a few things i think uh, this is two sides to it quite clearly a, a supply side and a demand side uh, the supply side is obviously uh, one is obviously there are not too many quality papers because of the underlying issues also the supply side uh, has a sort of an uh, dynamic is that what is in it for a developer uh, if we really in terms of if i am doing a local uh, green bond uh, suppose if it's an inr denominated green bond i am really not getting too much in terms of pricing advantage between a plain vanilla bond or a green bond so uh, why should i go through the process of taking a certification etc and you know go through the sort of effort of getting it certified green um and in terms of for pricing so the, see any refinancing transaction which happens primarily the focus of a developer is to get his equity released now if to achieve a certain rating profile if i end up creating a large amount of if i creating a large amount of desa or something like that i am anyways not getting much benefit out of it and hence uh, the supply side i would say uh, there is not much of an interest for me for example we have done one uh, green bond last year which is about 1500 crores subsequently thereafter we haven't done and that that's a mix of it uh, one uh, we were um say in in my case my state utility portfolio was ready but there wasn't too many takers my central utility portfolio is now getting ready so probably i'll consider it uh, uh, separately uh, maybe a little later in the in the timeline and uh, frankly on the demand side again the challenge is obviously in terms of the rating profile uh, most of the indian pension or insurance companies under the pfrda or the iida guidelines they'll 
uh, or the pension guidelines they will uh, contribute a very uh, certain percentage into um, you know in in the listed instrument there has to be double a plus i think it's double a or double a plus whatever is the requirement that overall kitty is anyways uh, smaller and then uh, given that uh, there is much uh, um, obviously in terms of triple a other regular issuers which are there in the market they can also you know crowd out because for an investor he is also not getting any uh, specific advantage by investing in a green bond in terms of his allocation or or in terms of his capital allocation towards the exposure or anything like that and in that background uh, i think there is a lack of incentive on both the sides the investor uh, is facing more challenges in maintaining a rating profile he is restricted with having a double a double a plus and he, he would say i am more than happy to probably if i have to really look at a corporate bond i will just simply uh, go ahead and buy a hdfc or a reliance and then get done with it uh, because the uh, pricing uh, differences because when i a green bond when it becomes a triple a r pricing expectations is also fairly high so he's saying why should i uh, then take a, a you know bet on a, a new issuer when i have an established issuer who is fully liquid and if i really need to sell it subsequently uh i'll i'll be it'll be easier for me to uh, take an uh, take an exit so i think it's it's a lack of incentive on both sides and also uh, given that uh, and therefore the you know the whole uh, i think a clear mandate needs to emerge wherein the uh, the invest the investors i'm talking about primarily from a domestic side who are clearly mandated to uh, invest in um you know green denominated instruments as a part of their investment mandate now why am i focusing on say a domestic uh, institutional investors we be pension funds and insurance because by the time a global money gets rooted to india their first allocation is going towards high rated corporate papers and then some part of it is going to be allocated to the Uh, overall sustainable story with their own requirement in terms of the rating etc i think uh, given the urgency of the requirement the low hanging fruit is which is more in control of say a domestic uh, uh, regulators or the policy makers is to look at a large pool in terms of pension and insurance and try and create an enabling environment wherein they look at uh, the you know the green uh, investments more uh, if we leave it only to a choice i think the adoption is going to be a little slow it has to be policy driven where they are given a mandate to uh, compulsorily have say five maybe to start with say 3 5% of their overall portfolio could be with epfo or with uh, pfrd that 3 to 5% of their portfolio needs to be allocated uh, to the green instruments um obviously rating etc is going to be the investment committee's uh, preference but a mandate i think would go a, a longer way to create a market uh, domestically and once the liquidity and uh, overall you know i think understanding acceptance of a green bond increases in the domestic market i think that will open up sort of create a channel which will then bring in international capital uh to that segment um i am also given that india gets sort of uh, is now included in the emerging markets uh, uh bond portfolio i think that will be a natural corollary that the first money is going to fly into the uh, come into the government securities and but but it's not going to just restrict to government securities and that not be the end of story once that money comes there and uh you know the global investors are more familiar with the domestic credit uh dynamics they would definitely look at the next uh you know best segment uh, that coupled with the overall focus on uh, a sort of sustainability um green bonds domestic green bonds uh, would definitely become a you know sort of uh, option of choice and uh, could really uh, you know really look at good inflows but i think we need to incentivize at the end uh, frankly in india it will be driven by a government mandate whether we like it or we don't somehow uh, indian markets have always been following that story where the government comes up with a mandate and then probably the market picks it up and then starts running with and create a you know fantastic business model out of it the way we have seen in renewable 
uh, and i think that's a clear template uh, which is there for us to follow yeah so so both of you are saying uh, it's a push story rather than a pull story uh, yeah, pull absolutely. being the incentive so lack of incentive just a point of clarification from joyvin and if i can bring mohan mohan from london stock exchange is also on the group mohan is there a delta is there a differential between pricing uh, if uh, an issuer uh, puts out a green bond uh, do they do they get uh, a better pricing <coughs> and what's the that's for the developer and what's the incentive for for the buyer of 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 the green bond initially when the, there was this perception that we had something called a greenium basically a uh, pricing differential if you went and issued a green bond but if you speak to you know um arrangers of you know bond issuer issuances <clears throat> typically the this is a question that is asked by issuers all the time you know why should i do a green bond am i going to get 25 basis points off my pricing if i do it and you know the the more prudent arrangers will also say actually no there's no pricing differential but um what how they will explain it is this there's not going to be like a pricing differential where because you're a green bond you can get an x percent off your x basis points of your interest cost but <clears throat> in the international capital markets what really happens is if i'm an issuer of uh, green bonds i can uh, market my bonds to a wider pool of investors right and as a result i can the price discovery itself enables uh, a better pricing outcome with the vanilla bonds so that is how you come to the conclusion that there is a pricing benefit from issuing green bonds in the international capital markets now joyven joyven uh, just just answer just as you're answering just this also had this point what's the benefit for the the buyer of the bond right yeah the so, issuer uh, might find greater liquidity you're saying and uh, because there's greater liquidity there may be greater competition and you have a price discovery which uh, shaves off 25 basis points but if you sit on the other side why should i buy a green bond right now in the in, in the offshore markets uh, the the thing is the 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 esg uh, the the pool of investors especially from an esg perspective has completely proliferated there's more anecdotally there's more demand and supply for good quality green paper right so so therefore you know if there is a good quality issue coming to the market with the right structure with the right a uh, corporate background with the right narrative there will be investors who actually want to get allocated uh some exposure to that name because of that from an investor's perspective why since i'm a pension fund or a mutual fund why i have that is because i need that paper to allocate within my portfolio which is then repackaged to my retail investors now in india i suspect that's not the case because the in you know, the returns are compared to the offshore markets quite quite attractive even for vanilla instruments um, whether it's equity or debt but i think you know if you can create as i always mentioned if you, if you can create a situation where together with the regulators and the market you create a demand for a uh, more uh, thematic the you know bond issuance this green or sustainable as the case may be then the market will start to turn in the sense you know the we as i have always said you know supply will always fo- you know follow demand and you will start to see this converge you know the trends that you've seen globally you start to see within the country itself where as more retail investors see the benefit of uh having uh, putting their money into sustainable um uh, products you know investors the pension funds mutual funds will also see the benefit of allocating more and more of their capital towards it we have to it's a, it's a, it has to, it has to be a combination in the, the the you have to make it bankable as well because you have to make the bond credit worthy you have to you have to make you have to incentivize issuers to consider this as a as part of their fundraising uh, solution a lot of issuers might say why should i spend another you know 50 uh, $50,000 or $100,000 if it's in the indian market to to uh, to towards the cost of going coming green but i suspect the 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 answer to that is you do such a thing you start to 
create you start to start to signal your esg ambitions to the wider um uh market you know if i am an if i am a green bond issuer and if i am a good quality green bond issuer you 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 you're out there evidencing your esg ambitions to the private sector to investors whether it's bonds or not you actually attract more people coming in and wanting to engage with you to understand what your business is and and as more and more fpis and others investors from the offshore markets look at your business they might want they might see the benefit of aligning themselves their investments with somebody like you who has already walked that path so i, I think it, it is those discussions we should have with the cfos of these companies and and educate them on the benefits you know you should take a longer view take a longer view and educate them and i think engage with them as well to kind of make this a a, a more mainstream product right so so you are also essentially saying initially there has to be a push from the government and the regulators to allocate a certain portion of the assets under management towards the green product the thematic product that 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 uh you were alluding to and that would perhaps start the market um, otherwise there's not enough incentive on both sides the issuers would say well why should i go through the pain and the buyers would say well what's the what's the benefit i'm getting if there's no difference between a plain vanilla bond the same company issuing a plain vanilla bond and and a, and a green bond other than you know certain green credentials so which brings to the, the point of educating uh the 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 market as a whole um yeah um, i would say that i actually i endorse uh, what, uh, all that joyvin has said on this and um, as far as greenium the concern i mean i'm i sometimes get a little bemused by some of the announcements i uh, hear or see or read about in india for example even the government said that uh, they'll defer a bond a green bond issuance a sovereign green bond issuance because they're not sure of the greenium that they'll expect right i mean i think that's a, like a little bit of a appended way of looking at it i think greeniums will happen more frequently you issue as well right and uh, and <clears throat> when when investors are uh, you know assured of uh, you know the, uh, not just return but also of the risk involved in 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 subscribing to those papers and uh, as far as um, as uh, the other side is concerned like you know what what uh, what makes uh, a lot of people especially you know uh, in more developed capital markets actually go for these kind of securities just to give you a number there we have in london alone more than 300 uh, you know funds with a combined assets under management of about 260 billion dollars which are all esg mandated they are esg mandated that means the people who are investing in those funds and the people who are investing in the funds which invest in those funds they all uh, have a very esg investment outlook right right it goes that it goes from individual investors people who are holding pensions etc all the way to asset managers who so you know there's a demand which comes from there so with such so there is a situation where in more developed markets like london you have much more demand much more money chasing fewer securities which is not the case here in india right there's there are very few uh, esg mandated funds if at all it's quite negligible here the other aspect i thought uh, and i think you touched upon it uh, earlier is i think that as far as our um, you know our, i think uh, our external commercials borrowing policy in india is not in sync with what's happening externally in terms of interest rates and yields right so uh, for example uh, you know as you know the the question of uh, uh, indian uh, issuers issuing bonds overseas or tapping overseas bond markets there is a um, an all in cost which is imposed by reserve bank of india on external commercial borrowings which restricts uh, uh, it's about what uh, you know whatever the benchmark treasury rate is plus 500 basis points which restricts the number of issuers can actually tap international bond markets but you know when interest rates are going up in the west maybe there should be a little bit more flexibility here whereby we could look at whereby we could look at you know increasing the you know the the uh you know the flexibility in the all in cost so then you'll have more people actually being able to tap overseas markets as well obviously when interest rates come down then maybe like you know there's you could revert to a norm but i think during the pandemic at least for triple a or uh, like you know investment grade issuers um triple b minus for, for you know international issuers 
So that concession was made by the RBI. So the policy like that could, should be extended, you know, in tune with what's happening in other markets. Like if you have interest rates like touching 5% and beyond for governments, then surely then, you know, uh, if you just have that kind of uh, restriction, then there'll be like, people will find it difficult to pay those expenses overseas. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Ma, uh, Mohan. So, again, the, the, the resounding answer from all of you is uh, a push mechanism has to come from the government to jumpstart the, what we call the takeout ability of, of the, the debt portfolio of banks and, and uh, <coughs> investors. Uh, and the, the lack of depth in the bond markets is a huge, huge barrier to bringing wholesale monies into the sector, which kind of backends into the project finance or lack of project finance available uh, <coughs> by the lenders. And they'll they'll <coughs> claim all sorts of uh, risks, but uh, because there's uh, constraints on the liquidity side, wholesale liquidity side, there will be constraints on the project finance side. So ticking along as we are ticking along is fine, but if we have to reach the numbers that uh, all of you said, in terms of 50 uh, gigawatts a year, we're going to run into some serious uh, weather or forests where we won't find the, the adequate liquidity. So thank you. Thank you for, for answering uh, the one of the biggest challenges, questions on the biggest challenges we have. We've gone past the hour uh, into, into the discussion, and I'll open it up uh, on more targeted, more specific questions. Uh, we can touch upon uh, debt financing, general debt financing, um, for projects or SPVs, we can touch upon uh, SME issues. We can touch upon new instruments that are that are lacking in the in the or required in the market. So so let's let's open it up. I already see a few questions. Thank you very much. Um, just for those who don't know me, um, I'm the head of policy and, and research at the International Hydropower Association, uh, which uh, we're 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 a collaborator with the GH2 on uh, and the Global Renewables Alliance obviously have a, a view around um, around financing for hydro. But I come from a background in the wind industry uh, and bonds haven't been terribly successful there. Um, there's a long story behind that, but um, one of the issues was that BT agencies really didn't engage with uh, with that and um, and therefore it was, it was a difficult um, to issue the bonds because the rating agencies just weren't there. I'm just curious because I'm I'm kind of new to this conversation about whether the rating agencies are still playing a, a bit of a spoiler uh, role in this, or whether they're fully engaged and and doing uh, the right job, or whether they're a barrier. God, yes, the rating agencies are still kind of playing the sport, so as to say. Uh, we as uh, developers, for example, you know, uh, Gagan had asked, uh, sort of put in the chat box. Uh, we did um, uh, a green bond issuance. I think about uh, more than half of it was, um, uh, you know, SECI, uh, the best uh, private counterparty to have in India. Uh, then another, the other half was with uh, almost uh, with a um, sort of a history of almost uh, three, yeah, about two to three, three years plus of operating history. These are all solar projects, uh, but still the kind of, uh, uh, and because it was a uh, initial, uh, it was the first uh, issuance uh, for us, we were definitely a little sensitive in terms of the rating, uh, but to achieve that rating or to get the rating agencies to agree to our uh, view on the rating, as well as uh, frankly, uh, what the investors had asked for, um, I think the amount of uh, DSCR and the cash uh, buffer that we have agreed uh, on a hindsight, I, I don't think uh, that probably is really, uh, I, I won't uh, term that reasonable. Um, maybe it's been two years since we have larger projects, they have gone through a longer process. Um, maybe yeah, uh, the next time when we engage in the for rating of green bond issuances, maybe we would probably uh, learn from uh, that phase and try and structure them better. Uh, also, I agree, Gagan, I think tenor uh, remains an issue and that's uh, that's more of a 
uh, and that's a, that's an issue uh, which is uh, i said it needs uh, more of a push than a pull uh, investors because most of my green bond was invested or sort of subscribed to by the uh, bank uh, investors which you know keep it in their either a, most of them are private banks they keep it in their trading books um but long term players were away uh, given again uh, they are more happy picking up because there is no greenium so as to say and they are more happy picking up uh, aaa or similar rated paper from the uh, from established uh, corporate houses who are regular issuers so i think it, it's it's a mix of uh, quite a few things but to address gordon's question yes rating agencies are still a little uh, i i would say a little more conservative uh, than uh, what they should be definitely the statement of mind does have a bias of a developer but i think as a as a as a independent uh, long term sort of watcher of the market i think they can be they can take uh, a little more uh, maybe a little more lenient calls on the rating so so definitely one take away for us is to engage more and more with the rating agencies and understand their methodology and and uh, why are they kind of throttling uh, the supply of uh, paper coming to the market right so that's that's something for us to to take away gagan uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about the sentiment behind your 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 observation if it's uh, just a three year tenor it defeats the purpose right yeah i mean i think amit elaborated on i guess some of the constraints or the realities you know <laughs> that uh, that one has to operate under if one is looking to uh, go to the domestic bond market but i think uh, and, and of course i forgot to mention i mean thanks for pointing it out the dscis yes, that was also quite <laughs> quite something right that uh, but i guess in a way you know that's the price one has to pay to be uh, you know a forerunner in the market right and the at the end of the day these were probably one of the first if not the first uh, unsupported explicitly unsupported triple a rated green bonds in the market the earlier ones have been uh, credit enhanced so so you know i think that from that perspective it was really a first mover sure of intent you know i think people have previously spoken about how a lot of this is also about demonstrating intent Now, i think uh, sanmit larger issue and some of these points have been pointed out or mentioned by other speakers but yes i mean i feel that the domestic bond market has to be opened up for uh, green issuances out of india because at the end of the day uh, if you got a 25 year inr uh, denominated revenue inflow uh, and i think your 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 equity backers are not backing you for your ability to play or you know manage the forex risk right uh, so it's better to be raising the money lo- it's better be raising money locally than overseas and i think four things need to happen for that uh, it's the demand side the supply side which people have already talked about also i think opening the door to foreign investment because unless it is fully accessible to foreign investors then it's really money that's just circulating within the system uh, internally in india right so really you want to not only get that demand a certain you know i would say a, a certain amount of supply in the, in the market to create that demand through green mandates whether it's 1 2 3% 4% of 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 the uh, aums of the major institutional investors but also open the route for foreign investors to come in uh and 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 really participate in it but but so that route, that route exists already it's the 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 fx Uh, risk which uh, plays out mostly right <clears throat> it's, it's hedging market. also it's hedging as well and and actually i'm not clear maybe some of the other folks out here could uh, could clarify um, you know and maybe amit you might know this others but but were these green bonds that you issued were they fully uh, purchasable by foreign investors or were there any restriction on those different matter that the eventual investors would have been somebody else domestic but uh, But did you look at that? I think I I, I really uh, I don't remember uh, was there any restriction on FIs buying them. Okay. Uh, but frankly, we did the issuances at the bottom of the market, 
the printed coupon was uh, sub seven. So I think yeah. it's basically the market which probably prevented they being traded in the secondary market thereafter. What we understand that they continue to sit with the original investors, yeah, because the uh, they were priced uh, the coupons are printed at the bottom of the market. So I think yeah. that's a separate issue. But I really don't think there was any restriction in terms of FII is buying them. I don't okay. think so. Uh, so on the FII uh, bit, uh, you know, not very sure. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned and as Amit also mentioned, given the pricing levels of the green bonds which have come in, which have primarily been sub seven, rather between six and a half to seven. Uh, I mean, FII. Whether I can, you know, circle back to you whether they were uh, uh, allowed or not. But at that kind of a level, I. I uh, don't see any institutional investor, you know, outside banks, uh, uh, pension funds, or insurance companies to be uh, really looking at uh, that kind of a return. They were quite, uh, I mean, pricing-wise, uh, very, very uh, finely priced. Yeah, so, Sorry, like, yeah, yeah. just it's the hedging, I guess, is also the other one, right? You want foreign money to come in, somehow that forex risk has to be addressed. So, yeah, I'll just. Summarize yeah. or just just leave it on those four things, you know, uh, the supply, the demand, and trading a pathway, however it's created for foreign investors to come in. And I think you know, it's. I actually think, at least the project loans. Remember, project loans themselves are rated, right? I mean, I think project loans for that have backed um, renewables projects have done fantastically well, um, and you know, which is which is my point is that what's the yeah. What's the difference between the underlying risk? The risk doesn't change, right? And 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 I would almost say that rating agencies may have been a bit too harsh on them. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and pro probably based on the experience of of, of you know what you know of, of thermal, let's say, or whatever. There's some sort of overhang. So I think if if there would be a, a minimum supply of green paper that would come to the market, and there'd be transparency and people could see how it's been performing. That in itself will be a great um, catalyst, I think, for creating uh, a sort of a self-supporting, uh, you know, uh, uh, market for green bonds. Sure, sure. Chandra, do you have a comment? Chandra and Joyvin? Yeah. Just to add here, I think, uh, you know, what happened with this, the SME IPOs where, you know, market making was made compulsory. So I think if there is a way to really look at, uh, uh, you know, creating a compulsory market mechanism for some of these green, green bonds over a you know 10 12 year period i think that will probably solve a lot of problems and even those fis who want to come in and probably you know take the chance of uh, investing at whatever six and a half seven percent interest rate with hedging cost etc i think they probably see an exit because exit is the most important part of the market you know so if you people see exit then probably they are willing to take that kind of a risk so i think some sort of a market mechanism where Maybe some sort of, uh, you know, if you remember, there was a coal sales fund which was created by government where 100 rupees was initial, you know, tax and then it went up to 400 rupees per ton. So some, similar to that, I think some 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 sort of a fund could be created from with a, some sort of sovereign support. And that thing that could be a great leveler in terms of, you know, supporting these uh, green bonds, which uh, and the money could be drawn from the, uh, uh, you know, those uh, uh, those funds really to make it more market, uh, uh, you know lucrative for the investor because otherwise uh, you know uh, more uh, the bankers can actually more comment more in terms of the liquidity and you know how things actually move in the market uh, but creating liquidity i think an exit is the most important parameter and i think uh, this is something which is going to be a great uh, uh, you know initiator for india in terms of how do you really create the green market market in the next uh, you know five to seven years so you you're suggesting market making by bringing more liquidity yes. and ensuring a minimum yes. floor price Right yes. for 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 the investors, but doesn't it make sense rather than investing money on on the bond side, shoring up the bond pricing or the yields? Wouldn't it make sense to fix the 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 core source of the problem, which is the discount risk, uh, and and uh, improve the credit ratings of the underlying projects in the first instance? Because uh, then otherwise, people will start manipulating the market, right? If they're getting a minimum, it's it's that's no difference than that's why that's why an experienced market maker will actually add value, you know. Otherwise, <laughs> and as well, I said, as I can I go on record. Experienced market makers are the biggest manipulators. Right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, just to add here, you know, if you if you look at what I said in the initial part of my uh, comments, is that uh, uh, 
you know having uh, uh, having an escrow mechanism which will actually make uh, you know things better in terms of how cash flows come to a particular escrow account and you know from there they are distributed i think this is probably another way to really look at how things uh, uh, you know give a comfort in terms of uh, rating and maybe the rating agencies actually need to you know some lower some of the criteria for uh, energy transition projects to really you know come come forward and get funded so maybe escrow mechanism plus you know some dilution of the rating criteria uh, could be another way to really look at i mean these are all issues which all of us need to sit together and, and debate at length and uh, yeah. but these are some of the suggestions which could actually help in terms of deepening the market for at the first point and second is making money available because transition has to happen you know the esg mandate uh, uh, is there for everybody but unless we really move ahead and you know do the funding part of it how it can actually come forward uh, joyben anything to add yeah. i think we have we have to learn the lessons from how um thematic bond issuance has got to be successful in the offshore markets and maybe try and replicate some of those lessons into the uh onshore situation uh, but you know do it in a way which makes sense for india i i think the biggest driver here should be the regulators where the regulators kind of incentivizes issuers and investors uh in in taking exposure to <coughs> uh you know thematic fixed income issuance is the reason why is we need a there's a huge uh, amount of financing that needs to be raised for india's transition to you know climate friendly a climate friendly environment um climate mitigation etc so uh, so so in order to get to the you know to unlock that private finance there has to be some way where it becomes it should not just be voluntary it should be where you know there's a there's a real regulatory push to enable that environment um and once once the market starts to see more and more green issuers coming into the market in a, in a credible way then i think it will drive the curiosity of others to actually follow um from a creditors perspective too we'll have to understand you know where the uh, whether it's green sector or the energy sector where there's a perceived credit risk because of the underlying uh, supply being to uh, you know to the market you know because of the where the underlying like supply goes to we have to again see how the government can kind of uh, incentivize these issuers to go to the market by providing credit enhancement solutions whether it's to the public sector or or better capital treatment to banks who can take exposure to this so so i think it's 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 i think that's the my my in my view that is the way forward for for uh, green issuance is out of india great great so i think we we can all take away this particular aspect that as much as uh, the developer community and and the uh, the, the climate uh, transition and energy transition community is asking for mandates from uh, the 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 big polluters to buy green power or green energy uh we need mandates on the on the wholesale finance side as well because otherwise uh, you would have misallocation of money uh, the the project finance demand would have been created but not enough liquidity supply on project construction and then then take out financing so i think that's a that's a great message that's come out of uh, this particular debate uh, uh so i think we can we can put that uh, put that aside and let's spend let's spend the next 10 15 minutes just on asking uh, questions around uh, the the project finance side of it so there are two questions which are related jitendra and arjun both seem to have the the, the same question so quick question on on the structuring part of it on the project finance side so given the history of renewable energy in terms of you know the depth of liquidity the uh, the operational history as such you know the construction risks being known and and various of the parameters that i'm sure you know the, the audience over here understands um versus the limited understanding of you know gs2 of the contracts or you know pricing risks or or of take you know structures as such and obviously you know you know the lack of operational history um is there merit in splitting the spvs when it comes to project financing one for the renewable energy component and the second for the uh, molecules part of it um, and and if it is uh, if it is indeed um, you know sensible to blend financing together you know for both electrons as well as molecules um would we be able to see better terms as a developer in terms of you know what the lenders would be comfortable with 
पोजिशन Uh, so Arjun, uh, if if I if I could summarize the question, it is about uh, having generation, uh, say renewable generation, and uh, you know, say the molecule part which would be green hydrogen in one SPV. Is that what you are referring to, alluding to here? Absolutely, sir. Yes. So you know, green hydrogen molecule slightly early days, uh, but uh, uh, you know, given uh, that uh, these are two different projects. Uh, uh and i understand two separate of take agreements for the same would also be there uh, as a lender we would be comfortable or we would be more uh uh you know we would be more keen that both uh, the constructs are in separate balance sheets preferably and you do you know uh, financing for them separately uh because you know one set of lenders uh, so you are aware of who the generation you know renewable generation lenders are typically if it is a greenfield project there are says x or x banks y nbfcs uh, who are who are uh, who are there in that space and while that space is yet to evolve for the uh, you know green hydrogen the molecule green ammonia part uh, but once it evolves you you will have a separate set of lenders and uh, you know the way the debt will be structured will be quite uh, you know the terms may be different so it would make sense to keep them on separate balance sheets and have spv level refinancing uh, spv level financing terms agreed uh for agreed with uh, you know the respective lender that's my take on it uh, while uh, you know the scenario is yet to come to uh, to come to test uh, yet uh, but that would be my two cents on it well uh, thanks or abino let me just qualify before any other speaker also you know wishes to respond or abino thanks for that uh, that response if if there's a proposal you know for example you know to your to your bank uh, to any institutional lender here Uh, for the same developer looking at both the components as an integrated uh, project you know both the electrons as well as molecules getting into the same balance sheet as such would there be any benefits because i would be combining you know the electrons part of it which just have uh, liquidity and, and operational maturity with the green molecules assuming i'm the developer developer for both okay uh, so so basically then you are saying that you have an operational uh, renewable generation capacity so say supplying to any of the uh central or state utilities or state discoms mm -hmm. and you know you are uh, putting up the molecule facility in the same balance sheet and you want to sure. uh you know uh, gain the benefit that say a large or a significant part of the debt is being covered by a more acceptable uh and a proven established uh, project so to say absolutely uh, so uh, yeah so in that context i would say yes it would bring in some benefits uh, in terms of you know say whatever point 5.6x of the dsc are coming in from uh from an established and a bankable uh, uh you know project so to say and uh, given that you know uh, while the pricing of the molecule side and other you know green hydrogen ecosystem is yet to uh, yet to evolve and yet to you know uh, uh get acceptability as such it will definitely help as a test case uh, so now that you have qualified it i would say yes just a follow on question sora uh, would it help so both to everyone in fact would it help if we brought uh, green hydrogen green ammonia uh, safs uh, uh, green methanol in uh, priority lending sector would that help and if the question if if, if that's the case i mean what sort of uh, pricing benefits uh, would the projects be able to get if they were included in priority lending so you know there are while the priority sector lending uh, benefit you know uh, quantifiably varies from lender to lender but here yeah, around 35 to 40 45 bips uh, is the kind of uh, pricing advantage most of lenders would get internally uh, per se uh, you know given the psl uh, uh, regulation uh, having said that uh, while commercial uh, impact is one thing second with most of the indian private sector lenders uh you know lagging behind in their psl achievement uh this could spur on uh the offtake uh in terms of you know the, their credit appetite uh, for uh, green hydrogen green ammonia green you know sector as such to 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 you know to take off in a meaningful way uh having said that uh, so they would each lender would uh uh you know assess the sector as per their internal uh you know guard rails as per their internal policies so uh, uh it would become you know slightly more palatable commercially 
uh, but uh, the guard rails and the policies will have to evolve uh, you know the way it has evolved for renewable sector over the years uh, from the point that there were very few lenders uh, and very high tariffs uh, to the point that the tariffs have and you know obviously the uh, uh, you know hard cost or the uh, cost of the raw material in terms of modules in terms of inverters have also come down substantially exponentially in fact so that evolve the you know sector will evolve uh, at its own pace uh, however this will be, make it slightly commercially more palatable and uh, you know will push certain lenders who are lagging behind more in their on their psl targets to be more open to the sector that's that's my view and is uh, uh, sort of is the benefit of 30 40 basis points passed on to the the borrower or not really see partially if not fully okay okay all right good now thank you that's that's very useful um so maybe maybe just to do the final wrap uh, can i ask each of my discussions apart from the wholesale financing question that uh, that we addressed the take out financing questions regarding the bond market that we 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 addressed in the first hour or 90 minutes uh, what are the two top two additional uh, changes in the market you would uh, you would like to see uh, thanks thanks anmit uh, i think uh, uh, and it's you know it's on the lines of the discussion that we just did is so that if you see uh, uh, one definitely i want to see is a government mandate to the long term uh, deep money uh, investors like pension funds and you know uh, insurance companies be given a clear mandate to invest a certain percentage of their uh, portfolio in the in the green uh, offerings uh, whether they want to look at a primary market or a secondary market that's i think a credit call which their boards can take but a mandate has to be given there that's number one uh, uh number two uh i think would be in terms of uh it's more qualitative is that we do a sort of a capacity building or a deeper engagement with both rating agencies and uh, the investors to see that the uh, the risk uh, profile of state utilities as well as the corporate uh, the cni counterparties is improving overall both with the lps coming in the state utilities improving and with the uh, you know sort of the decent growth numbers that the indian economy is uh, posting the corporate uh, balance sheets are improving and the cni counterparty risk profile is also changing but that's i think is a more more long run process uh, which all of us will need to continue to work on to you know create that appetite but i think in terms of low hanging quick result fruits is to uh, sort of uh, work with the government to get uh, pension funds and insurance companies getting a clear mandate to invest and uh, yeah as we discussed last time during the last conference if we can get a priority sector lending tag to this sector in whatever form and manner i think that's definitely going to help so these are my two immediate requirements and the third one in terms of the uh, knowledge capacity building that's like a long term wish list right thank you amit uh, sorry that uh, regulatory push uh, is definitely a must uh, uh, both the areas which you mentioned uh, the deep uh, you know patient capital is with the uh, uh, insurance uh, companies and pension funds uh, and not so much with the mutual funds but to have at least uh, you know a small percentage a 0.5 or a 1% to begin with uh, uh, you know which would contribute say 15 to 20000 odd crores uh in the dcm market uh, for from mutual funds and uh, a higher percentage uh, because you know insurance companies and pension funds have more patient capital uh, and less pressure on redemption or uh, you know liquidity so 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 that uh, as a starter along with psl benefit uh, uh, which amit mentioned uh, again uh, that would uh, you know uh, be uh, uh, required for kick starting uh, the dcm market uh, deepening and to be followed by uh, a separate lens uh, to look at the rating uh, for uh, for you know uh, the energy transition projects uh, while we we are all aware and amit rightly mentioned that transmission has already witnessed uh, uh, that acceptability uh, and they are getting the rating benefit also most of the projects uh, within the transmission space post operation uh, you know post uh, operationalize uh, getting operational they get a triple a or a double a plus rating at least 
but uh, we have not seen similar uh, uh, you know uh, similar rating uh, appetite for uh, gender on the generation side and so so the challenge will be on the green hydrogen side so the el method which crystal came up uh, with some time back uh, which is your expected loss rating and el 1 and 2 being the acceptable level for uh, the insurance and pension companies i think that needs to be uh, as a construct as a structure become more acceptable and uh, uh, again pushed both on the regulatory side uh, and by uh, both on the developer side as well as insurance and pension company side for uh, you know for this uh, for the debt capital market ecosystem to to be more uh, acceptable and viable so these are my two uh, views great so again uh, regulatory push and then you bring in uh, looking at uh, ratings mechanism very very carefully and uh, and deeply so thank you thank you sora for your contributions chandra uh, yeah three four uh, points which are important uh, obviously as uh, as both amit and uh, sora said you know some amount of regulatory mandate in terms of investment is very very critical and important uh, you know uh, the, the challenges that uh, most of us are seeing uh, the psus or the discoms are facing uh, we really need to move towards uh, some sort of a uh, escrow based financing mechanism where the rating can significantly improve i think that is something which needs to evolve in the country which is very very critical because then that's where maybe if required some state government or central government you know some sort of guarantees can actually help and uh, making the you know lending or credit rating more uh, uh, you know meaningful so uh, in terms of what the point arjun raised uh, i think mixing of projects is something which we as a consulting firm would definitely prefer because you know if you have a re project plus a h2 project green h2 project i would actually prefer mixing of project because we have certainty of cash flows in terms of uh, you know the renewable part and that in incremental cash flow will actually help in terms of uh, you know supporting if there are any shortfalls or or issues in terms of uh, you know green h2 project going ahead or or maybe getting delayed by a year or two so third uh, important point and obviously we'll we as consulting organization will be happy to you know work with the bankers and rating agencies to really deepen their understanding uh, we have till date uh, you know we actually manage 1000 megawatts hour of uh, energy assets uh, storage assets in the us we manage 18000 megawatts of uh, real hardcore uh, energy assets in the us so uh, you know we have done till date 1000 megawatt hour of consulting as far as energy storage is concerned in india so we'll be happy to you know be a partner in terms of uh, capacity building for uh, you know in, in the entire ecosystem uh, we have very very deep understanding of the entire electrical uh, you know sector as a whole and including batteries and uh, uh, we are doing now significant work in terms of you know, e mobility as well as green hydrogen so we'll be happy to you know be partnering with these kind of projects uh, in the future yeah thank you so much thanks andra you also endorse the regulatory mandate but you say taking the uh the ratings aspect so uh, credit enhancement whether by way of guarantees or escrows uh should should be looked at and mixing of projects uh is an is an interesting uh, way to hedge your hedge your risk because if one part of the the value chain goes slower then at least the other ones delivering the the, the cash so thank you thank you chandra for your contribution last not the least joyvin uh, uh your top two recommendations I think my top two recommendation is um, is is um, is basically as I mentioned earlier. You know, we need we need uh, the regulators to step in, and secondly, I think we need to also educate investors and issuers about the benefits of going ESG. So, um, so it has to be a, a, a combined convergence of uh, effort to to enable you know an outcome which which which. which facilitates private capital inflow to um <clears throat> in transition projects such as uh energy the regulatory push is by far the winner over here uh every one of you has said then and, and i'm glad that we we identified that as a as a significant um uh, uh input that we can give to the government and and start writing that that paper uh joy when you also endorse much like amit Uh, a broader capacity building uh, but in, <laughs> very specifically educating them on the ESG matrices and ESG fundamentals and what are the contours and why they would benefit in the in the in the long run so so thank you for your contributions as i said right at the beginning this is the the last uh, of this series not not the last series in all 
will will kind of uh, do a summation and release uh, a lot of the contributions that all of you made over the last two months in about two weeks' time uh, at the Climate and Energy Transition Finance Summit. So if you haven't already gotten your uh, invitation, please reach out to me or Nish, and we'll make sure you get the invite. Some of you are already speaking at that particular event. And then what happens uh, from from after the summit, of course, we have still have the COP28 to, to, to get through, uh, but early in the, in the new year, we start the application now that we have identified some of the biggest constraints both on equity side debt side market making side technology risk etc et we start uh, applying these structures and instruments uh, to bring the financial products out as all of you have said is the the, the need of the hour so on that note uh, folks thank you so much uh, to all the lead discussions for your your contributions and uh, all the participants who have uh, patiently listened in and uh, participated in the in the discussions thanks everyone else i won't keep you waiting any longer um we look forward to seeing you who was coming at the summit and those who want to join us virtually please drop me a line i'll send across a virtual uh, link pass for you all to join in virtually so thanks once again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day